All right, so today Moz and I have come out to the Sydney Fish Market to test out this little lens that probably none of you have ever heard of, the new Sigma 35mm 1.4 Art Series. Better late than never, right? So no doubt you've heard about the 35 1.4. Canon and Nikon make their own variants that are really popular, but they're 50 to 70% more expensive than this one, and this has just been getting outstanding reviews for its optical quality. So let's run through the specs on this one compared to those two others. Taking a look at the profile of the Sigma, it's longer and thinner than the Canon and Nikon ones, but at 665 grams, it's actually a little bit heavier than either one. This A-series lens has Sigma's latest generation hypersonic motor in it, so it will focus even on cameras that don't have a built-in autofocus motor of their own. And it does have full-time override for manual focus. Looking down the barrel of this bad boy, it's surprisingly complex. 13 elements in 11 groups. Compare that to the Nikon that only has 10 elements in 7 groups. This Sigma has one aspheric and six special low dispersion elements, which you need when you've got so many different glass elements in such a small place. Closest focus on this guy is 30 centimeters and it'll focus down to one 5.2 ratio. That's almost identical to the Canon and Nikon. The front filter thread is 67 mil. So if you're buying filters from scratch, that'll save you a little bit. The Canon is 72. Of course, this has FX and DX coverage, and this one has a T-value of 1.5 for Canon, but surprisingly 1.6 and even 1.7, depending on the Nikon body you're using it on, according to DxO. However, that still is better than its competitors. A big surprise for me, though, is that this one does not have a rear weather sealing gasket on it. So despite the fact that the lens may be beautifully built, there's no gasket in there to prevent moisture getting in between the lens and the body of your camera. I think it's fair to say that this is probably the most hyped lens of 2013. It's been getting rave reviews almost unanimously, and there's still a worldwide waiting list for this guy. Let's return to the walk around at the fish market for a bit of hands-on fun. Hello. You're not shy, are you? Oh, but you're so pretty. Don't hide behind her. <laughs> Even though it's, you know, a 1.4, with the wide being a 35, you really have to get pretty close to things to really blow the background out. So, of course, being a fish market, this place is also famous for rats of the air, seagulls, pigeons' slightly good, better looking cousin. Can I get up here without scaring him off? Oops, sorry, buddy. You think I got food? I haven't got food. Check out this hat. No, I like your hat. <laughs> Very cool. I don't really. I <laughs> love this. What is it, a tacky Burberry, man? Come to the fish market. You can see annoying birds, crappy weather, and tourists in really crappy overpriced designer gear. All of them. I'll totally get um, told I'm racially vilifying people, huh? Now I've got to choose the biggest one, then manhandle it so Moz doesn't want it. Let's uh, do the classic Beauty and the Beast shot at 1.4. I'm not sure who is who here. And you can see there's not a lot of mozzet. Uh, not the most fascinating test subject for this lens. I'll get a couple of sample shots, but I have to say, having tested this one out for the last hour, not too long, you know, everyone's been banging on about how good the optical quality is compared to the Canon and Nikon equivalents, but it's the build quality that really impresses me so far. I haven't checked the images full screen to know how the image quality really is. But the build is not like a third, <coughs> excuse me, a third party manufacturer that's making a bit of an effort. It's as nice as any lens that I've worked with, really. The, the matte finish is just lovely. All of the dials have a great amount of resistance to it. It's really well ba balanced as well on the 800E, which is not a small camera. 
the real test will be how does it hold up to the 36 megapixels when looking at it at full screen. But we'll come to that after I eat these. And it's also great that it focuses down so close. I know oysters are a love-hate thing for most people. And you have to keep in mind, you do get quite a tiny depth of field with this guy, even up at like 2, 2.8, if you're in close, you don't have a lot of room to play with. World's ugliest birds. Ibis sounds so nice too. Oh, look at the goiter on this mofo. It's got massive neck balls, check that out. So as I said, this is a hugely hyped up lens. Now, a lot of you know what you're paying for on a higher quality lens is how it performs in the hand. Of course, people like to see full crops and you know pixel peep when looking at reviews. So I will do some of that. We'll even compare it to the Nikon 24 to 70 28 at f at 35 mil to um, see how they compare to each other. But keep in mind. Beyond you know, the testing and the initial buying period, you probably aren't going to be doing a lot of looking at stuff full res. This shot at f1.4 shows you just how blurred out you can make the background. Beautiful, beautiful. And if you get in even closer, it's even more blurred out there with flat lighting. But it shows you just how tiny a depth of field you have there. Look at the little bit of stubble on the side of his face that's sharp. Going up to something like f16, you get everything beautifully nice and sharp. but you know, you don't buy an f1.4 to shoot at 16, right? Okay, let's take a look at some shots taken outdoors, including full crops. This one was at f1.4, all shot are focused on the trees. There we go at 100% crop. Now, I know that that may look like blur, but it's actually aberrations. It's not from a slow shutter. Let's go through these next ones. There we are at f2 and 100% crop. These are from the center right-hand side. Again, it looks like there's a bit of motion blur or something, right? It's not. Here we are at 2.8 and the full crop, and it still looks a little bit blurry. But let's be clear, at f2.8, I was at 1 2,000th of a second. The leaves weren't moving faster than that. Check this one out at f8, which was only at 1 250th of a second, and you can see it looks much, much sharper and as if the blur is suddenly gone. That's because the aberrations have gone, not because of the shutter speed. Okay, here we are on the Nikon 24-70 at 2.8. Same crop from the middle right-hand side, and you can see it's already beautifully crisp there. Considering that's wide open, whereas here on the Sigma, that's stopped down from its maximum aperture of 1.4 to 2.8 that's significantly softer and it's not motion blur. I know people are gonna say that, but look at the left of frame and the brighter green leaves you can see are sharp. It's that the edge of the frame is not as sharp and that there's some aberrations coming in here. Now taking a look at the Nikon at F8. Again, perfectly crisp. Here we go with the Sigma. It is beautifully crisp and actually I think the fine contrast there is really, really good. But you have to consider, if you're buying it to shoot at 1.4, here we go comparing it even stop down to 2.8, the Nikon kind of smokes it. This next series is to demonstrate flare control and the vignetting present on the lenses. That's the Nikon at 2.8. And here when we shift to f8, you suddenly see, oh, there was a vignette at 2.8 and there it's gone. And you can notice on both of those a significant flare down the center. Here we go on the Sigma at 1.4, there's really obvious vignetting there. Then as we step it up to 2.8, it clears, and then by F8, it's just gone. And I would say that the flare control is actually better on that one. Okay, finally, let's compare bokeh and sharpness. That's on the Sigma at 2.8, and there we go at 100% crop, reasonably nice and sharp. But to me, the Nikon bokeh is actually softer at 2.8, and it looks sharper on the 100% crop. Just a reminder, that's what the Sigma was at 100% crop. Of course, the reason you get a 1.4 is that you can step it down to 1.4. So there we go, at 1.4, I was in really close there and there's hardly anything in focus. As we go in on 100%, you can see it's really not terribly sharp. It may have front focused by a millimeter or two, enough to make this not particularly sharp. Okay, so. It is a fantastic lens, don't get me wrong, I think the hype is warranted. Just the downside to being such a hyped product is that it comes with such high expectations. 
it focuses really well. The bokeh is quite nice. The build quality is lovely, despite the fact that it doesn't have a rear gasket, which I just find bizarre. But none of them are like, oh my God, this is so fast to focus, or oh my God, the bokeh on this is so much better than other lenses that are comparable, or so on and so forth. It's not but it's just a really nice overall performer. It's really, really nice in the hand and it's at a much better price than the competition has to offer. So if you are in the market for a 35 mil prime, you know who you are, you want a fast aperture like 14018, then definitely I would highly recommend this one. If you're not sure and you're just getting caught up in the wave of reviews, have a think about the options out there. You know, maybe a 50, maybe a variable, uh, sorry, a zoom lens like the 24 to 70 will better suit your needs. Have a little think about it because whilst this is nice and contrasty and sharp and great value, it's not for everyone. For me, I won't be buying one of these. 35 is not a focal length that I use a lot, but if it is one that you use a lot, you have committed to buying a 35 prime, definitely give this one some serious thought. I hope that helps. If you have one of these, then leave us your thoughts below, or if you're on a waiting list somewhere in the world, let us know how long you've got to wait. Jump over to the website and sign up to the mailing list, and you can get involved on the community forum. I'll see you soon. <laughs>